It's Casper. I'm an electronic engineer and software developer, and I use KiCad. Uh, if you want to grab these slides, there's a lot of hyperlinks in here as well, and you can anything I reference, you can look up the slides, and you'll be able to get to the thing I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, experiment of sorts. It's probably not hugely useful yet, but it's quite interesting, I think. And it's about um, defining PCBs as code and using code synthesis as an EDA tool. Um, so it's got, it kind of all started with KiCad um, and the file formats in KiCad, the text formats. And like a lot of people that use KiCad, I think I, I dove in and started editing things when the GUI wouldn't let me do what I wanted to do. Um, and while I was doing that, uh, you know, I'd have my text editor on one side and KiCad on the other, and, I'd, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice if KiCad immediately refreshed the view when I edited it and I could see what I was doing in a more kind of interactive fashion. Um, and kind of in parallel, this, this, I was interested in Haskell, and I was learning Haskell, and I wrote a parser and a writer for, uh, for, the, PC, for the KiCad footprint format in Haskell. Uh, just because I had heard that S expressions are easy to pass, and that could be a good learning exercise. So I wrote this, and then I went kind of uh, way overboard with the testing, and I checked it against every footprint I could find. And I used something called Quick Check, which is probably one of my favorite things about Haskell. It's a, it's a property testing tool where you, uh, it will generate random test cases for you uh, based on uh, and then check them against your assertions. So if you say something is true about your program, it will generate random data. And you know, as long as you tell it to do it, by, th like by default, it'll try 100 times. But you can tell it to do thousands of randomly generated, uh, throw randomly generated data at your program to try and disprove your property, your assertion. Which in, in the case of the parser and the writer, because they're symmetrical, is if I say my if my Ki if I write out my KiCad expression and pass that again, I should have the same expression. So uh, I do that with this tool as well. Um, but but kind of back to S expressions, because you know as I as I wrote this pass, I, I learned more about them and how they actually you know uh, quite they're not only easy to pass, but they're actually a representation of the pass tree. It's qu it's quite a simple representation, and I learned more about Lisp and the schemes and uh, kind of other languages that make use of this. So I kind of uh, I stumbled across Racket, which is, uh, which is touted as a programmable programming language. So what I found when I, when I read up on Lisp is that there's a lot of, there's quite a strong focus on macros and modifying the language and uh, to your needs and defining new languages within the language uh, because of the kind of the ease that S expressions allowed with the, with the, that S expressions allowed this, you know, to, for you to do this fairly easily. But so in Racket, you kind of it has quite nice GUI bindings as well. So, you know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking about my editor and what kind of editor I wanted to create. So I was quite pleased that, that there's nice GTK bindings for Racket, and it has this IDE, which is. Uh, where you can interactively play with Racket code. So when you start off with Racket, the first thing to say is, I'm going to use the like Racket language, because that's not a uh, pre-given thing if you're using Racket. So you can, there's also something called a slideshow language. I didn't use this for my presentation. But you can interactively, um, in, the, in the REPL, you can, you can, uh, it has graphical output and uh, other need, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of different languages. Um, there's even an implementation of Python. So Racket kind of took this idea of using macros and, and uh, modifying the language to the extreme that you don't even need S expressions in your language anymore. You can define other languages that don't use S expressions. So um, there's, a, there's an implementation of Python in Racket. Um, so I thought, wouldn't it be neat if not only we have an editor where we can modify the, the, the file format, but we can also kind of mix in uh, a programming language into, into, the, into the format. So having a, a language, like a KiCad language in Racket. And this is kind of how far I got with it. I'd hoped to make more progress on this before I gave this presentation, but you know, life kind of caught up with me. And I'm giving another presentation next, which is where I spend most of my time about uh, 
open source hardware sharing platform. But just about this, so this is how far I got with it. Um, so you can mix in this, this general purpose programming language into the KiCad format. So if you look at FP line, that's, that's, that's what the footprint format in KiCad looks like. And you can, um, here's a for loop that kind of it, that outputs these FP line statements. So you can kind of recurse arbitrarily deep into this and in the end it will flatten it out and give you your KiCad file back. Um, so this is kind of what, this is kind of what the code looks, that's kind of how that works at the moment. Um, there's, a, there's a syntax rule for the module, which is the high level kind of, this is my KiCad module, my footprint, which is defined as a drawing of items. And then we define the drawing, what, what it means to draw an item is to kind of execute all the functions that that item is defined as and f flatten it completely so that you only have this, this kind of flat KiCad file. And uh, there's a little bit of uh, just checking what layer this, this footprint is on and kind of translating that to something within within the within the KiCad, within the record code here. So this to clarify, this is kind of what the source of what my editor looks like at the moment. So this is kind of defining the Ki so the starts of defining a KiCad language. Um, so at the bottom, I define an FP text item with again, it's, that's a KiCad uh, footprint expression really, uh, and I define it as a, a function that takes in the DC, which is a drawing context, and then executes functions on that drawing context. So this is really, I defined FP text as a, as a drawing function. Um, so I, I mean, kind of before you get too excited about it, all of this, it's really early days for this. Uh, I already mentioned I'd hope to make more progress on it. And this is kind of, this screenshot really shows what I've done in the best light possible, as in this isn't, I'm not using the right units. The, the line style isn't quite right yet. You can't really do anything useful with this yet. Um, but um, just to jump ahead a bit, um, I had some more ideas surrounding this. And it, it would be nice, actually, to, if I managed to develop this further, to use the, the, the graphical part so to do graphical manipulation or you know, traditional mouse-based manipulation or um, um, direct manipulation, as well as the programming side, to kind of to be able to intermix these two. And I started thinking around this problem, and I came across a project which does a quite a similar thing for SVGs. And you kind of you have this; they have a special uh, DSL for SVGs, and then they have their graphical part here. And they've got done quite a lot of uh, uh, this is called Sketch and Sketch. I believe it's by someone called Ravi Chung. And there, it's in development as well. And they've done quite a lot, made quite a lot of progress, and do some interesting things where, where you, where the, where the kind of the graphical manipula manipulation side um, uh, generates the code for you that 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 isn't just, uh, you know, isn't just is readable still, is readable still, and usable and modifiable on the code side again. But what I didn't find in Sketch and Sketch it is um, some way for you to generate loops like this. And when I say loops, really this is a kind of a reversed map statement. If you're into functional program, it returns what's what it what what it the state the thing it defines. It doesn't just you know e execute uh, side um, uh, side effects. Um, so I was I was I was thinking about this problem on how how can how can I get how would I get my editor to generate this kind of code for me? And I, and I came about, and I, I, I heard of um, the Rosette language, and I'd heard of like formal verification before, and I always thought, yeah, well, that's something that you know you do when you you're working on safety cris critical systems, but I'd never heard the the, the term programming synthesis kind of uh, with this as well, which is what Rosette advertises. And Rosette is also a language in Racket. Now, what, Racket, what Rosette does is it connects R Racket up to SMT solvers. That's satisfiability modulo theory uh, solvers. 
which doesn't tell you much more if you don't know anything about it. But um, what, what it essentially means is kind of similar to what uh, I was doing with, with, uh, with the Haskell testing, but instead of just, you know, picking up random, you know, g generating random data, it actually tries to exhaustively uh, go test every, poss every, every possibility. It's like an exhaustive testing tool. Now, this uh, doesn't sound, it really doesn't sound possible. And then, you know, you know, if you ask me how do the how does this work, it's really very complicated because it's, it's essentially an NP-hard problem, and there's a lot of interesting algorithms that go into it, and that's kind of out of the scope of this talk, by which I mean I don't know really. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of SMT servers, and it's an active area of research, and um, the one that that Rosette uses is Z3, which is actually written by Microsoft, um, Microsoft Research, and is MIT licensed. Um, and so, again, Rosette kind of hooks up the Confuse programmer, which is you right there with a the question mark, um, and and gives you uh, lets you use Rosette to generate uh, uh, to gen to do programming synthesis. Um, and this is this is a, this is kind of the talk that got me into all of this, and it's a very good talk, and I recommend it for anyone interested in the subject. And the links are in the slide. Um, but there's a bit a bit of a question. If you you maybe you've understood now that it's an exhaustive checking tool, the SMT solve is an exhaustive checking tool. But how can this be used for synth synthesis? And uh, really, the way so far if I understand it correctly. If anyone knows more about this, feel free to interrupt me if I'm, you know, speaking nonsense. But you pretty much give it a template of your desired construct, so you could give it an empty for loop, and you leave kind of the holes in there, the question marks, and um, then you then you. Uh, I've left the. Oh yeah, no, it's the next slide. And then you can give it an assertion about your code. So you would say, I want to synthesize something that's the equivalent of. If we go back. Um, so this is trying to generate a pad at, at a particular location, kind of simplified uh, KiCad expression there. And you could say, I want this to be the equivalent of a pad at 0, 1 and a pad at 0, 2. And then you could, with Rosette uh, and this assertion, get a Rosette and through, back through the SMC solver to give you the solution to that. What kind of, what kind of for loop construct is required to get this output here? Um, I mean, you might think that, well, that's a lot of complicated stuff that you'd have to learn to maybe make something that's not necessarily useful. I mean, I've, I find it interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure footprints are necessarily the, 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 the best application for this. One of the most exciting things about all of this research is this is a feature in Microsoft, Microsoft Excel, which is called Flash Fill. And they use programming this, and it's from the same. Uh, I believe the person that came up with this has uh, was was studying with the same people that I've, I keep linking in. And this kind of from examples. If we go back to if it goes when it loops back to this out there, you give an A an example, and you say flash fill that, and it tries to figure out what kind of transformation you wanted on on that data. So it writes a little tiny program for you to do that transformation. And it might get it, it might say, I don't know enough about what you've told me there to synthesize all that. And if you give it another example, it will be able to figure out what you wanted, what kind of program you wanted to generate. So that's my talk for now. It's a little bit short. but So there's uh, quite a lot of time for comments, suggestions, questions. Yes? Yeah. And uh, in, in constraint solving is used in EDA in many areas. For instance, uh, simple cases, uh, matching impedance uh, along the line, if it's in transmission line and so on, can be seen as a constraint solving problem. And layout itself, just auto layout, is a huge uh, constraint uh, solving problem. All right. However, it's usually done on the kind of low level. If you can, uh, we, the Lutakad, can express, for instance, like uh, you have an operational amplifier, and it's supposed to have an amplification of uh, 10, whatever. Uh, if you can express that logic um, somehow, maybe using racket or whatever, uh, now you can say like, okay, I have a, I have a resistor value 
of wealth, or like a tall K, uh, or I have a library of resistor values available locally, mm -hmm. which generate me a design which works given this, uh, this uh, schematic. Right, right, yeah. Uh, so this is, I think, a very interesting aspect of it. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think they, they might be, um, that might be there might be more inter like I said there might be more interesting areas than for editing footprints. I quite like uh, using the footprint format because it's quite limited and I can I can it's kind of I can get somewhere quickly. But yeah, I, I'm sure there's more interesting applications. Uh, any other? Yeah. So in this, what exactly parses your code that you added to the system? Because as far as I understand, the the thing that you write. Um, well, the, the way I envision it to work is that um, you c you write your you write you can write arbitrary code in here. And actually, if I ran this, you could um, you could go up here and say on the module and say uh, kind of execute all of that, and then you get your normal KiCad uh, PCB expression, and then you can save that. And you could you uh, I'm not quite sure how how those two formats will will work out. And, Sorry? Kind of the same thing with the What's that, sorry? Mac ports. Ah, uh, mad parts. Yes, I have I have I have seen that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering if this could be interesting if KiCad could read this format because it's already pretty similar to what is there. Yeah, I mean KiCad the the KiCad reads this is the KiCad footprint format. I mean, except for the for loop really. So if here, here's a here's a footprint. This is what the KiCad format looks like. Um, so you just need to flatten it to get it into KiCad. Um, yeah. For uh, for footprints, uh, antenna design is one area where working with some higher level tools than uh, manually uh, doing out something. Is, is kind All of right. Cool. That's very interesting. Yeah. And uh, the way people do it today, usually you just uh, find the book <laughs> or something with a recipe of how you do it. So you don't, you never, you just avoid the general problem. You just go for specific problems. But there are some cases where uh, that means that most antennas are very basic. Planar antennas are just uh, ready in one direction because they don't know to solve problems. Uh, mm. And you just change your space. Uh, but in general, if you can, this requires a lot of uh, kind of domain understanding. But if you can express that, you can generate. I think this becomes very interesting when we go past uh, PCB layout into the on proper substrate, uh, which is what we're currently doing. But when we're looking at, say, um, doing layout in 3D. So, saying we're doing additive, uh, our paths are additive, uh, made with a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. We don't have design tools that can do this in any good way. But mm -hmm. if you can express the problem, you can kind of do it for you. And even before that, you have flex anyway today. Like your PCB is not, maybe not going to remain flat on a on a surface or a rigid. So. Yes, flex and uh, multi. Like you might want to use your walls as uh, as your PCB and so on. Any other? Any other? There, yeah, I've got, I've got one. <laughs> yeah, a little bit short. <laughs> it allows people to move in and out. Oh. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed your talk. Really good. Uh, I like, I especially like the high level of you. It was good. It was really good for me. Okay. <laughs> You're there. I hope that, that there will be more Kikad developers. And yeah. I would keep meaning to. I can keep going up and keep like, getting the source, compiling it, looking at it. Uh, so it was good to have, get that high level view of how the uh, uh, thing is going. Let me see. Yeah. Would that, the, so the, the, um, the example tool. Will that work for the both canvases then? 
Is that fine? Uh, currently, no. The, so this is for Gao? Yeah, it's, it's only for the for the Gao. Oh, gotcha. Because in yeah. the end, we would like to have Gao, you know, both in Sibinu and Isha. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. after that, we, we have a very constant way of writing tools. Mm. But that's not in 5, is it? Uh, so 5 will still have legacy. Uh, um, well, there are, there are both. Yeah, yeah, I know they're both. But um, was it even on 6? Get rid of legacy cameras? Yeah, probably. Probably on 6, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are just a few things probably that we need to port from the, from the legacy to the new canvas. And yeah. after that, we can try to drop it. Yeah. I'm uh, trying to think what I miss. Sometimes I switch back, I can't remember why. Sometimes. I think quick deleting, like a shortcut. I think my shortcuts are not transferred somehow yeah, or something. Removing whole track or something. Oh yeah, removing segments. Mm. Like that. Yeah, I think you can do it with push and shove router when you have it enabled and then you hover over a track pretty easily, which removes the whole connection. Right. But it's a bit different than the legacy, so perhaps not many people really recognize that there is such option for that. Yeah. I'm out of water. Hey? No, no, it's your turn. My turn again. <laughs> yeah, this is why I didn't. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be useful if you had, uh, for instance, databases with uh, commonly known ICs and, and uh, SMDs, uh, where all the uh, all the connections are known? Mm. If you have the, that database that you can you extrapolate with the language those uh, those footprints and let Kikat automatically generate from a from a database given from a from a, a manufacturer. Yeah, I'm not sure this would help that much. If you've got the if you've got the drawing, if you if you've got the database and you've got the footprint, this, you wouldn't really need this. I, the only thing is if it, if you want to do do parametric thing. The other area is interesting if you if you look at like 3D CAD, there's the, the, they do constraint-based CAD. You say, I want this to be here, I want this to be here. And then I think the, the, the code synthesis and the constraint solving could be quite useful again. Like in FreeCAD, for instance, if you have a, a flange and you have put in 10 holes, you, you augment the diameter from the, fl uh, from the flange, mm -hmm. it either will uh, disperse the holes if you have ten holes over the the wider diameter, yeah. or it uh, could be that if you fix the diameter to, to that he puts in two more holes. Yeah, so that's parametric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's about the gist of it. Mm. Mm. That's cool. I'm going to prepare my other presentation. I'm so glad the internet's good with all the. And all this. Close. Oh. Oh, Have you? Have you? I think I'm, I can't. The keyboard's not working. The keyboard doesn't seem to be working. Oh, is it blocked? I don't know. Um, strange. Uh, oh, that one. It seems to be working. I'm just trying to. <laughs> it's just that. Okay, maybe in um, full screen mode it doesn't work. I don't know. Yeah, there's uh, this one. Nice. Strange. <laughs> what? I don't know. Close and reopen. I don't know. I've never actually played with this screen. Let's say. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So, I, I go for 20 minutes of speech and then 5 minutes for questions? Yeah. Okay.